give you an overview um, of this particular two features. Those of you who uh, joined E2B in Berlin have a year ago uh, got a very quick overview of Windows Server 2016's features. Um, yesterday, uh, Thomas and Michael um, spoiled some information around other servers and containers. Um, I just want to deepen uh, more today. So we'll focus on uh, just these two topics. Quick show of hands again, who's worked with Nano Server before? Anyone? More of you? Okay, who's seen containers already? Windows containers? Uh, Linux containers? Uh, okay, some of you are familiar uh, with, uh, with, with parallel to Linux containers. Okay, um, so let's start with Nano Servers. I could talk about both topics for a whole day, so um, I'll just punch in the most important features. What? I think um, both features, nano servers and containers, will change the way we work with Windows Server on a very fundamental way. And um, of course, like every feature of Microsoft product, it has a deep um, motivation. And every one of us, um, well, has found himself, um, in, well, let's say, finding reboots not the best behavior of our machines um, we get. If we are following Microsoft best practices and patching our server systems um, every month after the Patch Tuesday, um, well, of course, Microsoft improves their patching um, um, algorithm over time, but most of the times we still have to reboot and we still have to move a lot of data around and we need a lot of resources. That are the most fundamental feedbacks we get from customers when talking about resource consumption. In my personal opinion, this is not the biggest um, disadvantage of huge Windows Server image, it's another one. It's security. <coughs> well, why are there so many Microsoft patches? Because 85% of them are fixing security holes. Security holes and um, daily heavily used features like the bitmap icon library or the fax client service. Everything we use pretty heavily on our primary core systems, especially on the server side as well. So, if they are not there, if our servers are really, really optimized for the cloud, we don't have to worry with these kind of things. And um, that's what um, was the motivation behind Nano Server. And we had a great discussion around yesterday in the keynote um, around Windows Server Core. And well, who is really using Windows Server Core in production today? Three of you are, four of you are, we use them ourselves and our customers. And well, we like it because it helps in some way. But let's rethink the promises Microsoft made us around Server Core. Well, it's so much better in terms of resource consumption than a full GUI deployment of Windows Server. Well, basically you save 500 megabytes of hard disk space and 200 megabytes of RAM. Let's convert this in terms of money. Let's rethink that you can't buy hard disks that are so small that they only fit on Windows Server, so we have some hard disk space available. And if you want to calculate the costs of 200 megabytes of RAM on a virtualization host, well, let's just say it doesn't matter. Microsoft says, well, we don't need that much updates. Anyone updated Windows Server 2012 R2 core? What's your experience? Less. less updates? Yeah. Well, not really. Less reboots? Yes. But it receives the same update packages. Windows Server 2012 R2 update is also available and a requirement for core servers. So every update that are required on the full server will also well, download it for installation on the core server as well. So you don't save the time. Yes. You save three reboots a year if you patch every, every, every month. Who's doing that, by the way? Who's patching their Windows Server every month right behind Patch Tuesday? <laughs> None of you are, because Dropbox has a hassle of rebooting every month. One guy. Very great, by the way. I really like it. But um, the real world experience says, oh, yeah. Oh, the server hasn't patched in nine months. Maybe hit the update button now. Well, that's the real world um, out there. And um, this thing is really in there. And Nano Server will change the thing. Nano Server, in my option, is a core server fulfilling its promises <coughs> this time because it's so small, so fast, and requires so less updates. I will get to some numbers in a minute. 
So, Nano Server is not a new product. It's just a new installation option for Windows Server. So, you download Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 3, hit Setup X and say, I want to select Nano Server. Well, it's not in there. It has a complete new deployment model because Setup X is too big for Nano Server. And I will cover how to deploy a Nano Server uh, in a second. So, it's a complete rebuilt version of Windows Server. And it's not uh, based on the approach, well, let's look what we can take out of Windows Server. No, it's built on an approach, well, start from scratch and let's only take in the things that uh, we really, really need. By, uh, just to give one example, if you work with Nano Server and Technical Preview 2, the biggest component of Nano Server was the anti-mailware client with around 60 megabytes. And Microsoft says, oh, this is so huge. Well, just leave it out. It's now an optional feature of Nano Server. I'll cover that later. So even the 60 megabytes of uh, the anti-malware client that Microsoft believes anti-malware is very, very huge and important is too big for this cloud-based um, installation option. So here, here's a statement that follows the server call pattern. There's a very huge difference in the deployment method. You can't select it in the installation GUI. There's another deployment approach I will talk uh, about in a second. But it's a very interesting thing. You can switch between the three basic user experience, full UI, mixed mode with some basic administrative controls, and call server on a classic Windows Server installation. This will also continue in the current technology preview of Windows Server 2016. But if you choose Nano Server, you stick with Nano Server. You can't upgrade it to a core server or a full GUI server or can just, and that's the best practice we are seeing out there, installing a Windows Server with full GUI and then removing um, the Windows parts. No, Nano Server is a Windows without Windows and you can't change that. Uh, but it has its advantages uh, I will cover in a second. So, when do you use nano servers? It depends. Nano servers doesn't include any Windows server features or roles. If you want to add a Windows role or feature to nano server, you have to include their packages. It's a lot like um, you already know if you've worked with, with Linux uh, packages as well. It's a very similar um, approach to that. And because that's a basic nano server image, it's really small. I think it's around 380 megabytes. And that's all you need to, um, to run this Windows server. And if you want to include more than that, you just have to um, install it. Basically, you use it for um, everything that is currently deployed on uh, physical server systems in the Windows world. This is basically Hyper-V host and um, the storage system, scale out file server, storage spaces as well. And application services that are optimized for the cloud that are running in a cloud host environment like Microsoft Azure today. And Microsoft Azure is a really big example of, um, of why cloud service is important. Two months after the release of Windows Server 2012 R2, was released in October and starting in December, Microsoft Azure started running on Nano Server. That was years ago, that was three years ago since Microsoft Azure started running Nano Server. And now we think such a demo strategy is saying mobile first, cloud first. Nano Server is a really great example for that. So this is already proven to be successful in one of the um, hugest cloud in the world. So it's uh, not kind of banana software that really needs to deploy. It's very, very <coughs> today. You can't install an extra or MSI file on Nano Server, so you rely on Nano Server compatible features and roles, and of course as well third-party software. Drivers can be used on a nano server environment, so you don't have to reprogram your drivers um, unless they come with some XE or MSI files that are needed to um, extract. And Microsoft has already announced um, agents for their management products like System Center and like Backup, already included, as I told earlier, as anti malware. If you've played with nano server before, you now need to enable it as an optional package. So let's have a quick look at the improvements nano server. Um, brings us in terms of updates. If you can't see um, the color codes, uh, full server installation we see here, core server and nano server. 
So the number of updates we need to install is reduced um, on a great factor, especially the number of critical security bulletins because all these unnecessary components like Internet Explorer is not there, like graphical um, libraries not there, and like um, PDF support not there. And so we don't need to update um, these kind of things and therefore we will have the new um, update model for nano server SKUs. As I said, the most critical point is security. We still rely on Windows drivers. Uh, we don't need that much drivers because we don't need all the Windows things, all the audio things, the graphical things are improved, but the default service is running. Less than half, and I really like this one, the default open ports in the Windows firewall, just 12 to allow basic communications. You can remote desktop into a core server. You can't remote desktop into a nano server. Remote desktop isn't there. <laughs> so how do you manage a nano server? I'll cover that um, in a second. But um, just see us on a security um, footprint. And just to give you some numbers on a resource um, footprint. And I really like the kernel memory of 61 megabytes for a full Windows server installation. It's so small, you can even think about it running on a watcher like this one, um, or running on very small systems. I think there was an IoT session first thing in the room this morning, and a nano server will be a great thing for those scenarios. Install a nano server in 40 seconds. Who <laughs> installed a Windows server in 40 seconds before? In these 40 seconds, I'm not bare metal nano server, it already includes clustering, hyper-me. I use these 40 seconds machines to build a hyper-me cluster. A nano server in a VHD is roughly about 400 megabytes. If you download a Windows server in a VHD file or VHDX file, it's around 4 gigabytes of data. This is only 10% of it. It's still a full Windows server. And if you install it outside of a VHD, it's around, I think, 381, 390 megabytes uh, um, besides the drivers you have to load. Isn't that great? I see many nodding. That is cool. So, I talk about new deployment model. And everything in the Microsoft world that's looking really great has some kind of disadvantages. And so, I will now talk about how to deploy nano server. And we'll see it in a second bit. So, setup exe isn't the one to help us. Um, we just use the Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 3. It has a nano server folder in it. So you don't select setup exe. You just click into the nano server um, folder where we have prepared some features or Microsoft prepared some features that help us to deploy nano servers. The basic nano server with image, 142 megs, so roughly 140 megs of image, and in the packages folder are the components we need, words and features like Hyper-E, um, like clustering. This is available in Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview, you can all download today, so there's nothing hidden, nothing um, NDA, it's everything you can try out today. There are two PowerShell scripts that uh, will help you make it easier. If you want to use nano server in a virtual machine, in an library virtual machine, you just convert the RIM image, so earlier, in a VHDX file that you can run in a virtual machine. It takes about two or three minutes and then you have a nano server up and running in your hyper environment. If you want to run nano server on a physical server system, because you want to do it for um, hyper hosts or scalar file server hosts, you need to um, customize a few things, and I will go this step by step for you. But those few scripts are helping you in both scenarios, physical deployments, and virtual deployments as well. If you want to deploy nano server on a physical server system, things get more complicated than in the virtual world. Of course, that's why we use virtual systems, but we need to deploy hyper -V hosts. All of this, what I'm talking about, is the current, um, current um, uh, list of to-dos required for the technical preview. In the final version, I expect a lot of that to be simplified, and all major Microsoft management tools, like System Center, um, like the OMS suite, like Docker, have announced their support for managing nano servers as well. Even uh, some of you use 5.9 for hyper -E? See someone calling. Five Nine is already built-in support for nano server um, hyper hosts hosts as of today. So managing nano servers, deploying nano servers will get easier um, in the future. Four steps are required. 
we need um, to um, choose and select the right drivers for our physical systems because Nano Server has nearly non drivers included. You all know the really huge plug and play drivers library of a normal Windows system, it's gone. So we just select the right drivers, most of the time this is around disk drivers so we can reach our um, physical systems. We select the required boards and features because Nano Server without any service running, well it's just a bunch of uh, bits for doing nothing. So we select, in my case, I select clustering and um, hyper -E. We need to set a password. It's very important and it's very easy to, to oversee. If you're not set an administrative password, you can't manage your nano server. It will be running great, but you can't do anything um, because a uh, password is required for management interactions. And when we have set these parameters, uh, we convert the RIM image we saw earlier to a VHD. If you want to do more than that, you can name your server, like Sully or Patty or whatever you want. Um, typically, an other server will get that much management attention. You won't say, oh yeah, my nano server Sully needs some special treatment. If you have a problem with your nano server, you don't do debugging. You throw it away and create a new one because it just takes 40 seconds to deploy a new nano server. Who is that quick in troubleshooting a non-clear problem situation on the Windows server and just 40 seconds to fix? So it's just easier to deploy a new one, so don't take the time to think of the name of something. And I'll show you a script that will help you setting um, some things up for the first boot process to customize your nano server, doing typical things like domain join as well. So how do we do that? Um, you saw the packages folder in the nano server folder on the Windows installation media for Windows Server 2016. I had a screenshot three slides ago. And um, you just select the packages um, you can use. You can use the short names um, into selections because the Microsoft naming model is very easy um, to using uh, short names. And whoever has worked with unattended setups before with Windows systems will be familiar with the DISM command. Um, it can be used um, to put these packages into your NAS hub image. In this moment, we are entering um, the packages into the WIM file, so you should copy it to a place where you can edit it, where it's writable, um, to do these customizations. How do you set an administrative password when you have no setup? Any idea? PowerShell? Well, now someone knows some kind of PowerShell, but we don't have anything yet. So, we take an approach that is, I think, 16 years old, an unattended file. I installed my Windows Server 2003 systems with unattended files, the same way we used to customize nano servers. Um, this is an um, unattended XML I use to deploy my nano server um, library hosts, and there is a parameter just called administrator password. It's not there by default, so be sure to specify it. It's the only way you can manage your nano server. There are some other ways, a minute, like setting time zone. Um, I really don't care about the time zone on my nano server, but you can specify it there as well. Then you convert um, the nano server image on a writable location. And in the nano server folder included is convert Windows image. It's available in the technical gallery as well. A great tool to convert Windows installation media files to virtual machines running Hyper-V because the WIM file gets converted to a VHD or a VHDX file. It's a disk format that can rate it natively run on Hyper-V. Um, it's very easy to do that and then you are ready to power up your nano server in uh, your virtual machine or on your Hyper-V host. In this case, I don't do a bare metal installation. If I'm running this on a physical host, I just do a boot from VHD on my physical system, also my Hyper-V host. So my physical Hyper-V hosts are also booting from VHD and VHDX files. This is uh, possible since Windows Server 2012. Um, there is a, I did some, some measuring some years ago. There's a performance um, um, penalty of 0.3% um, compared to native disk installations, but the very nice thing about booting from VHD files, you can just take it, copy it to another physical system, and well, it just works. You don't have to do the setup again, the customization again, it's just ready to be deployed. 
We have an unattended file to inject um, this unattended file into our VHD file. We do um, a dism command as well to mount the image and then we just copy it into the place in the Panther directory. And the Panther directory is um, used during setup of nano server and every other Windows server SKU as well. It's uh, not that commonly known. If you create in the, in the Windows directory a new um, subdirectory called Panther, you can place a um, script there. It will be pulled during setup. And don't use, uh, don't forget to use to unmount the VHD and use the commit uh, because the access to the VHD file will um, not be successful. If you want to do more, like setting the computer name, use an unattended file. Same thing as administrator password, just include a new computer name. What I really like, this looks complicated from behind, but you will get the slides and just copy it out is to customize your nano server installations like display some things on the um, nano server management shell and I will show you this complex management shell in a second. Uh, there's a PowerShell um, script <coughs> and that runs, um, it's called setup complete, that runs after the first boot of nano server and only after the first boot of nano server installation. So everything you want to do, like the one once file, you just um, copy into um, this um, setup complete file and um, will run on first boot. Use this um, to mount the script and say you see it. Setup complete CMD gets filled with all the scripts we will execute. Nano server will be workgroup joined in a default scenario. Um, of course, nobody um, uses workgroups today. I also join my Hyper-V host to my management domain. So joining the domain can also occur via the um, unattended file. Very important aspect here is the administrative password to join the domain must be encrypted. Most of the unattended files I see for joining client computers to the domain are having um, including an unencrypted administrative password. Most of the time the domain admin user account, I really like it, it's very easy to fetch some data, um, but the um, unattended setup file from our server need an encrypted domain password. So we just include it, domain join. That's the contents of the file, so you can use domain join exit to create uh, the encrypted file. And there you go. Another option that really became handy, I have a nano server installation on this notebook in a dual boot scenario. I just copied the VHD file into this notebook and if I start up, I use BitLocker to decrypt my drive. I just can select which VHD I want to boot. Um, and because nano server is so small, um, I just copied some of them. Uh, here and I use uh, BCD Edit. Most of them, um, most of you have used BCD Edit around Windows Vista, having dual boot installations on your clients. It still works with Nano Server and um, it will back some Vista memories and who doesn't love it? So now we have deployed Nano Server. And if you boot up Nano Server, you basically see nothing on your screen. But there is a Emergency management service. Sounds very anxious, doesn't it? And I'll show you how it looks um, in a second. I uh, just have to enable it. It's disabled in TP3 um, in default. Just put it on. And then if you want <coughs> to install more software into Nano Server, well, throw away all your XE and MSI files. They won't work on Nano Server. Microsoft is currently working on a server and follow service to do some things, but the only way to add agents to the current version of Nano Server is through PowerShell uh, executing or just copying scripts into your image and execute them through setup complete. So, I know there are some um, software developers that are creating tools for Windows. I think now is the time to prepare for Nano Server. And if you've done all this and have deployed a nano server, and you want to say, okay, what's the great user experience I get with booting nano server? Here it is. This is a nano server. <laughs> it's all you see. You even um, you don't see the, the characters you type, so it's this very elevator. So well if you have not specified a management password through an unattended file. This is whatever, this is what you see forever. 
Yeah. Now, we have seen my session and oh well, I need to specify administrative password, I did. And then, be prepared for the ultimate nano-server experience. Here it is. <laughs> this is viewing only, besides one exception, I will go into the net for a second. If we have customized the computer name, as I did in my case with Nano 1, we see it here. If you've joined the domain, you can see it here. I've joined the domain called Workgroup. Um, and you'll see, okay, I'm running Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 3 Tuber. Tuber is the code name for the Technical Preview 3. And you also see the MAC address and the IP address and the IPv6 configuration of this machine. And Nano Server is DHCP client by default for IPv4 and IPv6. You can change that through unattended fire or um, NetSH, or you can use the emergency management shell because it's the only thing you can configure on the shell is the network configuration. In the current version in TP3, the configuration option, well, it is disable a network interface and enable a network interface. In the future, this screen will allow you to change IP address, gateway address, DNS server information and one. This is all you get on a nano server if you're sitting in front of it. So, this is not the real option to install Hyper-E on it. Question? Could you uh, specify VLAN configuration for um, putting in a management VLAN or something? Putting a management VLAN um, on this, uh, no. What you can do? As, um, using setup complete to do a NetSH configuration and then you can specify yeah. VLAN, VLAN trunkings, um, whatever you like. Um, the network stack is the same you will experience in the uh, whole other setup of Windows Server 2016, so um, I expect that you will. So, you will have the option to um, change the IP address but nothing else. So installing hyper rewards or installing virtual machines in front of a nano server will be a dissatisfying experience. So, okay, we have learned to remote management. Remote management means RDP into a machine, not working. So, management options for nano servers see pretty limited, huh? Pretty limited list of nano server managing options is this one. So, every um, aspect and every tool we know from Windows Server, even ancient tools like Registry Editor, are available for doing remote management for nano server. You've seen a lot of PowerShell today already, so uh, we'll see PowerShell later in the container session as well, so um, I will um, skip that. And um, there will be another experience besides from PowerShell and Docker. I won't go into Docker today because I think tomorrow the last session will be a Docker session. Docker is a management tool around containers. It will also support nano server, so if you're interested in more management around that, join the session to tomorrow. I will show you another graphical experience to manage nano server. And it is an Azure portal functionality. We will see in Azure and we'll also see on premise in some time. Here you go. This is the Azure preview portal, which offers a new feature called Windows Server Connection. This will also work with the full GUI version or core server version. It's not available in Azure or Azure Pack today. I expect it to be available in Azure Stack and expect it to be available in the Azure Preview Portal for some time. It's currently in a very, very limited preview, um, which um, I've not managed to get any more invites on myself on. And we connect to a Windows Server system on premise, enter the IP address of the system, and get some basic information. We can rename the server here, we can do the domain join here, we can do the network configuration here. So um, if you don't want to do the hassle of configuration we did in the PowerShell setup we saw earlier, we can wait for this experience. But this is not available today. So if you want to use Nano Server on TP3, this is an um, only way to go up with the resume. We see performance uh, metrics, we can start services, we can change registry keys, we can um, trigger the installation of management agents. So there will be a graphical user experience um, even for nano servers as well. So there is no need to RDP into a machine. Even we can't RDP um, into a machine. And um, I know many of you know, um, like PowerShell scripting, etc. But there is a graphical user interface. I even do a restart of a nano server service here. Okay, I'll stop this here for reasons of time. Let me scroll back to my slide. Here we go.
So of course you have PowerShell. Um, we have no native PowerShell nano server, we have core PowerShell nano. The naming is, I hope, not quite finalized. It's nothing to do with core server. Core PowerShell um, is a very limited set of um, functionality where everything behaves a little different, but we have still PowerShell remoting in it with the same capabilities we know uh, as of today. So just use it as a reference again. This is TP3, this is Tuba, and um, I expect this list to change um, a lot, but um, the most pain-suffering um, item I forget that's not working is scheduled jobs in some kind of way. So, so there's no automatic reoccurring of management tasks or something in nano server as of today. I really hope this will be included in TP4. TP4, any from management, any from uh, my colleagues that were joining in Redmond last week, any new dates for public release of the next version of Windows Server? Okay, no. Okay. <laughs> Let's just really hope it's not that much away. We saw the demo. Any questions around nano server? I will allow exactly one. You are lucky guy. <laughs> do, you, do you think they'll make the, the setup process any easier? Because it, it doesn't look that easy, and the adoption of core servers not being that good, and I think it, it will stop a lot of people using it. Yes. The uh, question was, uh, do I expect to uh, have a, a better deployment experience of Nano Server in the finalized version? Two answers. Yes, I really expected one because Microsoft, um, of course, knows the feedback of the core server story. Deployment and management is very, uh, very hard. My personal expectation is that Nano Server will be primarily deployed two ways. Completely unattended setups via Pixie Boot or whatever, or management tools like System Center. If you know the experience for a virtual machine manager bare metal deployment, um, many of us today say, oh, I don't really like this experience. It's working sometimes, but not very often. And I really expect um, to be a better experience around the management stacks uh, as well. Because the server is so easy uh, in terms of infrastructure and complexity, um, I really expect to be uh, from solutions. If you have a look at the 5.9 version for server on Hyper-V, it's a party vendor, for free, um, out available today, it has some very nice approaches for how to manage nano server and I expect to be available <laughs> some nice approaches like that for deployment uh, already. Nano server um, is a very fundamental shift for Windows Server where every role and feature aspect like hyper and clustering needs to be adapted for and I think it will be a way uh, before it evolves into um, what will be a very great product. And in my personal opinion, this is one of the factors why the release date of Windows Server 2016 was um, delayed until sometimes um, next year to round up that experience. <coughs> So, we're done with nano servers today. Um, I'm here to talk about two topics, and the second topic are Windows containers. Nobody had experience with containers before on the Windows side. I know some of you uh, played with Linux containers. The first thing I want to talk about is the naming definition. When you talk about containers, the term Docker is rare everywhere. Docker is a great management engine for containers, but it's not building or utilizing a container engine itself. The container engine is sitting in the operating system. In the past, in many Linux environments, Sasha? It's actually not true. It was before, but today when we installed this, this slide, the library gets the all input to libraries. It is not using Linux container anymore. Okay, so the Linux implementation of Docker is coming with a container version itself as of today. It's a runtime. Okay, so it brings a runtime. Thanks for the information. Um, on the Windows side of aspects, if you are familiar with Docker, you will be able to manage Windows containers with Docker. It will be a very near the same management experience like the container management you used before. You can use Docker, but you don't have to. If you want to learn more on Docker, join the Docker session uh, tomorrow. And I will focus on the other management techniques. Microsoft offers two types of containers. Windows Server Containers and hyper Containers. One important aspect, is the TP3 available, Windows Server Container. hyper Container will join later. A Windows Server Container is another form of isolation compared to a virtual machine. If you are running 10 virtual machines on one hyper host, you have 11 operating systems. You have one on the host from, um, on the physical system and 10 Windows instances in the virtual machine. 
The level of isolation is outside of the operating system. In the container, the um, level of isolation is around the application. Every container is sharing the same operating system kernel. Being that said, we don't need 10 additional Windows installations for our container. It's using just the Windows from the host OS, but every container is using the same version of Windows as the host OS. So there is no option to install a Linux container on, on a Windows host because they are sharing the same kernel. The level of isolation is different. But creating a new container takes about three seconds. Booting a container takes about six seconds. So it's very, very another different user experience than click on new virtual machine and wait minutes or in some environments hours. So it's very quick and easy. Can you deploy a container into a virtual machine to utilize the advantages of virtual machines like live migration in conjunction with containers? Yes, you can. But in the future, you can also use hybrid containers that also use um, the um, isolation model on a virtual machine basis in conjunction with containers. So you don't have to deploy a new virtual machine and deploy a container on it. It's just one step. A hybrid container is a conjunction of the virtualization layer and using the abstraction on the container level. As of today, Windows Server Container are included in TP3. If you're running an earlier preview version of Windows Server 2016, there are no containers in it. TP3 is the first release. Hyperweek containers are expected to follow later. There is a uh, dependency I will um, go into a uh, second. So, how do you do that? You manage your container. They're already both running on container images. I will show you one in a second. It doesn't matter if you're running Hyper-V or Windows Server, you manage them via Docker, Windows PowerShell, or via management infrastructure like System Center. System Center has announced to support containers in a future release. Quick question? Quick question. Where is the isolation happening between containers and which level, right? Um, operation um, OS kernel is the isolation level. It's Technically, um, standpoint, it's a built-in sharing of the kernel components, and if you uh, show you a demo in a second, um, you will get a more deeper understanding um, of the sharing level of the resources. But it's not um, isolation on OS level. That's the most important thing. On a security perspective, a virtual machine has a better isolation, a better encapsulation of resources than a container does, but a container is more handy, more faster, very quicker. Um, it's great for, for um, dev and, and lab scenarios and also great for I need to build a lab scenario. In my personal um, opinion, expectation, in the very near future, we won't install applications. We won't execute a setup exit. We will just take a container and put it somewhere in a virtual machine on a physical world. And, and if we want to use hybrid containers, we can also use um, the advantages of virtualization. So, when I say there are two types of containers, I have a physical hybrid host, like a good old Atari PC, running it on a virtual machine and deploying a Hyper-V container in this virtual machine. A Windows Server container is directly deployed on the container host outside of the virtual machine. And now things are getting interesting because I can also deploy a Hyper-V container inside of a Hyper-V VM. What is this, what we are seeing here? It's nested virtualization. It's running Hyper-V and Hyper-V. So nested virtualization is a requirement for hyper containers. So nested virtualization is available for Windows 10 on the insider ring as of today and will be a new feature on Windows Server 2016 to allow these kind of encapsulated containers. In my opinion, a Windows container will be the new default format for delivering software products. No more setup exit, just takes a container and putting thumbware. A hyper container will be the default unit of a single application. Oh, I'm currently running my web server on server 4. Oh, I really need another one on server 5 or I should move it to server 5 because I want to upgrade the operating system underneath it. I just take the container and copy it or move it to another server system. And this will be the deployment model of applications in the future. Hyper-V containers require not only a hypervisor, they require Hyper-V and they allow a management through PowerShell, Docker, or anything else, but I want to come 
to this one. How does the container look? And because my great experience with the internet, I will just jump into my pre-recorded video here. That one, there we go. Executing a PowerShell. And just having a look about what PowerShell command lets around containers are available. This is the list. Um, it's very, very easy uh, to understand the um, structure. Um, I need two things. I need a list of container images, Windows Server images. We can use these containers. And we need a virtual switch because we want our container to use the network, use internet. So the network stack will be shared through the OS, but every container has its unique network configuration. And what I'm doing now is to just create a new container. My container is named hello, and it's done in about three seconds. And I'm putting now uh, my container name into variable to just um, um, access it easier. And I'm starting a container. It's one, two, three, four, five, six seconds, and my container is up and running. Compare this to a boot time of a virtual machine. Nine seconds for deployment and starting is really, really great. And I'm now doing a PowerShell demoting session into the name. My container has got a DHCP address. I don't know the IP address of the container, but um, I'm just PowerShell remoting into the container, getting the IP address, and I even can now access the public internet out of my container file. I cannot break out of my container session because it's still an encapsulation, it's an isolation around my application in this term, my PowerShell application, and I'm writing my um, configuration or hello TDM file on the um, C drive. And what I'm doing now, I'm taking the standard um, image I've deployed here, I've customized with my text file, I can customize it with my application, with my uh, network configuration, and I'm creating a new container image. So I have um, established my um, development, my application is finished, and I'm now creating a new container image. That's how we will distribute software in the future. Let's just say, here's my setup file, my library, no, here's a complete container running my application, and I now have the second image um, available, it's called my image, and I now create a new container from this image. So every container we execute from this image will have my customization from um, this text file in there. I need to specify container name, container image, and my virtual switch to allow network connectivity for the container. That's all you need to create a new container. This will be possible from Docker, from Virtual Machine Manager, or in my case here, we are PowerShell. We have started our container and are now PowerShell uh, remoting into my second container. And um, I'm just running a file level um, directory check and we will see that our created text file on C is available. So, this is very easy management um, of containers and if I would create a new container from the standardized image, I won't um, see the text file in there because it won't. Work. It's all using the same kernel of my host OS or my virtual machine if I do a Hyper-V container with nested virtualization. It doesn't have the security boundaries of a virtual machine, but if I combine it with Hyper-V and with Hyper-V container, I can leverage both in conjunction. And it was pretty easy, wasn't it? <laughs> my application needs to be container aware. It needs to be compatible with this uh, because some features aren't just available. There's a list of features available that is currently supported like ASP.NET. There's a lot of um, third-party frameworks um, like PHP that are currently running on containers. On this container I'm running a web server I can access from the public internet. Um, I will give you the slides. Just check out the features. Download Windows Server 2016 to check out containers, to check out nano servers. You can't combine them currently. Containers run currently only on core server, not yet on nano server. I expect this in the near future where you can use container and nano in conjunction, but not as of today. So, I allow another question around nano server and containers. I have another one on isolation again. I, I know I'm boring. Uh, uh, <laughs> we, well, I mean, you're yeah. kernel level segregation, right? Yes. Uh, the TCP stack is shared. Yes, it is. Meaning that if I have a, one container hammering my my uh, my TCP stack, I will impact performance of the other containers. 
right? Yes, because we, we are sharing the same physical network stack. Lead. I have not um, been able to break out of my network stack of a container and access the network stack of another container. Um, I wasn't successful um, with that. Sasha wants to, to add something to it. I think we come to our session tomorrow. Yeah. 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 We have the solution and we have the security breaches now. Yeah, I... In the Docker session, uh, this approach um, will be will be continued. Okay, in, in general, it's not it's not same security. Yeah. It's a but different level of high level security if, if, if you follow some rules. Right. Okay. Right. It's, it's, so, it's, but it's out of, out of box. It's not there. It's a great feature set with many advantages and disadvantages. If you want to follow the story, if you think containers are great, I want to manage containers more deeply, join the containers as a Docker session tomorrow. When is it? Uh, we are last one. The last session tomorrow is around Docker. Um, come to me, see me in front um, to get your additional answers questions. And um, everyone, thank you for your time. I hope um, you've learned something around Container and Nano and continue to have a great conference. Thank you.